The Great Satan and the Axis of Evil Several years ago, the leaders of the United States and Iran traded these insults about each other, and its relations with Tehran tend to be one of the most worrisome for the United States State Department, made worse, of course, by Iran's nuclear ambitions and its territorial goals as Americans leave Iraq. Welcome to Agenda with George Friedman. George, what is it about Iran that worries us the most? Is it its steady move towards having nuclear weapons or the prospect of Iranian hegemony in the Persian Gulf? Clearly the issue is the changing balance of power in the Persian Gulf and the possibility, if not of hegemony by Iran, then certainly increased power. The withdrawal of the United States from Iraq has open the possibility of Iranian influence growing dramatically, or even domination of Iraq. The events in Bahrain, where Iranian-inspired demonstrators tried to topple the government, uh, Saudi Arabia intervened. Uh, the presence of Shiites uh, throughout the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and the absence of the United States, all taken together, have created a situation where Iran is going to be the largest conventional military force in the Persian Gulf region. And that would change the balance of power dramatically. In other words, a serious problem. The change in the balance of power is not necessarily a serious problem. So long as Iran and the United States and Europe, for example, reach some sort of accommodation. Under the current circumstances in which uh, the West is hostile to Iran, the Europe differently than the United States, but still hostile, uh, the growing power of Iran uh, over what constitutes a massive outflow of oil to the world um, opens the possibility of the Iranians being able to interfere with that flow and profoundly affecting Western economies. Right now, the United States in particular is aligned with Saudi Arabia. Uh, and it's through Saudi Arabia that it guarantees the flow of oil to the, to the West. Should Saudi Arabia become relatively weaker compared to Iran, and Iran plays a greater role in this, then the relationship between the United States, between Europe and Iran becomes critical. Under the current configuration of relationships, any growth of power of Iran threatens the interests of the United States and Europe. Turning to the nuclear issue, how far is Iran from acquiring operable nuclear weapons? Well, here's what we know so far about the nuclear weapons. Uh, first, Iran has not detonated a test. Uh, how far they are from detonating a test is unclear, but the distance between a testable nuclear device and a deliverable nuclear weapon is substantial. A nuclear weapon, it has to be small enough to fit on top of a rocket, for example, rugged enough to withstand the incredible stresses of launch, entry into a vacuum of space, high and low temperatures in space, re-entry, and must be able to work. Uh, that's a very complex thing. It's, it's not easy to do. It is not easy, but relatively easier to simply detonate a test weapon, but to go from there to a deliverable nuclear device that is reliable, since it had better explode on contact or there are consequences for the Iranians, uh, that's even harder. And it requires much more than simply being able to enrich uranium. Uh, there are many other technologies involved, most importantly quality assurance, making certain that each part works as it does, testing and so on. And I suspect that that's going to take the Iranians quite a bit of time if they can do it at all. Uh, I, I don't regard the Iranian nuclear program as necessarily the extraordinary game changer that others do. The real game changer in the Persian Gulf is the existing Iranian military force and its ability to operate uh, against any combination of forces native to the area if the United States leaves. Uh, the nuclear program is a wonderful negotiating device which compels the West to sit down and talk to them, uh, and they're in a position of strength, it appears. But it's far more than that than a military weapon. It's a psychological weapon, it's a political weapon, 
And in that sense, it's almost irrelevant whether it, it ever exists. Let's talk about the chasm between the United States and Iran. Does the United States have any kind of strategy to bridge it? Washington is of two minds of, on Iran. One is the ongoing belief that existed since 1979 that Iran's government would face a popular uprising that will topple it. And there's always been this belief that it would happen. Uh, Washington and the media got tremendously excited in 2009 during what was called the Green Revolution, which Stratfor's position was that it was a pretty isolated, relatively minor affair that would be fairly easily put down by the government as it was. But there's still the ongoing belief that there's tremendous dissatisfaction in Iran that would translate itself to revolutionary action. The other idea is that there are political tensions in the Iranian elite that will tear them apart. Well, it will certainly be stressful, but there are stresses in the British government within uh, the American government. Uh, I don't see the stresses in Iran, even between institutions such as the presidency and the supreme leader, as leading to the same result. I think to a very great extent, this fixation on internal evolutions in Iran has paralyzed American strategic thinking. So what you're really saying, George, is there is no strategy. Well, there is a strategy. I think it's a, a wrong-headed strategy. But it's also a strategy that allows the United States not to make any fundamental decisions. The fundamental decision the United States has about Iran is in three. First, go to war very dangerous. Second, negotiate with Iran, uh, politically very difficult. Thirdly, hope for the best, some sort of evolution inside of Iran. Uh, the American predilection to hope for the best uh, relieves any American administration of the need to take unpleasant actions from negotiations to war. And so it suits everybody's mind to think that shortly you will have destabilization. What could the Iranians do? Realistically, they're not going to give up their nuclear weapons. I, I don't really think the Iranians care about their nuclear weapon. To, the, to Iran, the most important thing is the decision of the United States to withdraw from Iraq. Their historic fear has been another war with Iraq. That's gone because of what the United States did. Uh, remember, they had lost a million casualties uh, during the war of the 1980s. They don't want that again. Well, that's gone. The Iranians are at an extraordinary point in their history. For the first time in a very long time, it appears that there will be a drawdown of the, a global presence in the region. This opens the door for tremendous Iranian opportunities. And I think one of the things that's going on inside of Iran is a tussle, if you will, in the elite of just how much risk to take. It's not clear who wants to take more or less risk, but you're facing a situation where Iran could emerge with its historical dream intact, the dominant power in the Persian Gulf. And this is not simply an Islamic dream. This was the Shah's dream. This was his father's dream. This has been the ongoing Persian dream for a very long time. It's at hand. It's not a certainty. But that is what they're really focusing on, to be able to define the politics of the Persian Gulf, the oil revenues of the Persian Gulf, uh, the governments of the Persian Gulf. I mean, this is the real po opportunity, and I think the nuclear weapons is very much a side issue for them. Of course, the United States was a participant in trying to help the Shah achieve his dream. You'd think there'd be a greater upside in resolving the conflict. Is there any chance, any chance, of that point being reached? Remember that the United States in the 1960s and 70s had a dual strategy. One was the support of Saudi Arabia, the other was the support of Iran. Although there were tensions between the two countries many times, uh, it, it fairly well worked. The United States obviously didn't have support of the Iranians, but the United States actually since 1979 in the release of the hostages at the, at the embassy did fairly well with them. Uh, the Iranians blocked the Soviets as they hoped, uh, the Iranians were hostile to the Taliban takeover in Iran, in Afghanistan, I should say. Uh, there was a lot of cooperation under the table between the two countries, not because they liked each other, because they had common interests. Uh, out of that 
comes the fact that there is a possibility of some sort of alignment. But the United States has to make a historic decision. I don't think at this point it can be both aligned with Iran and Saudi Arabia. And the decision the United States really has to make is whether or not it's going to bet on the Saudis or the Iranians. The Saudis have been the historic allies of the United States, but frankly, uh, they're not particularly congenial to either American culture or sometimes to American interests. The Iranians are hostile to both, but they have a great deal more power and potentially are a more reliable ally. So the United States faces a historic choice between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Thus far, the, the administration has made it very clear that it stands with the Saudis against the Iranians, and that's understandable. Uh, but then it will really have to decide what to do. As Iran becomes relatively more powerful, the United States weaker in the region, precisely what does it intend to do to contain Iranian power? George Friedman, thank you. And next week, Agenda will look at the United States' relations with Russia. Until then, goodbye.